Thank you guys for joining us for the Restore Hayward Marsh Public Workshop. My name is Carla Myers and I'm a project coordinator for the East Bay Regional Park District. So we'll just give folks maybe a couple more minutes to join the workshop and then we'll get started. Carla, should I go ahead and post the agenda up there? Yeah, let's, let's do that. Okay. And is that displaying okay for folks? Good. Looks good. On looks my good. End. So we, we do want to let folks know that this meeting is being recorded on Zoom. So just want to put that out there and I'll mention that later once we start the meeting. Looks like we have about 22 people on the call, that's including district folks. So hang out for another minute or two. Thank you guys again for coming. Got 23 participants, got a couple more people. So it's 6.33 and we have 25 people on the call with us. You think we should get started here in a minute? Chris and Amanda. Okay, so we'll jump right in. Thank you guys again for joining us for this public workshop for the Restore Hayward Marsh Project. My name is Carla Myers, and I am a project coordinator for the East Bay Regional Park District. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items. Like I mentioned earlier, this meeting is on Zoom and it's being recorded. We do ask that you mute your audio and turn your video off for most of the meeting. There will be opportunities later in the workshop to ask questions. We'll be using the chat function in Zoom which is at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. And that'll be during a Q&A session after the presentation. And we also will share a link to a survey and comment card later on in the meeting um, that you can all use to share your feedback and ask other questions. So this won't be the only opportunity to give us your feedback. So also, if you have any Spanish translation needs or have any questions that you'd like to ask in Spanish, you can direct those to John Holder, who is the senior planner. John's email address is at the bottom of the agenda screen that you can see here. Um, we will also make sure to post his email address later on during the workshop if you need to grab his email address again. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to review three concept alternatives for the Restore Hayward Marsh project. So we'll dive into those in a little bit. Before we continue, though, I want to acknowledge that the Hayward Regional Shoreline is within the ancestral territory of the Hawkeen Irgen on the unceded land of the Ohlone Chechenyo speaking peoples. The lands within the park district are located within the territories of a diverse and resilient group of indigenous people who are descended from Ohlone, Bay Miwok, and Delta Yokut ancestral tribes. 
please join us in honoring with gratitude the land and the people who have stewarded it since time immemorial and who continue to remain deeply connected to the land today. So next we'll put up a short, just one question poll. Um, if you guys wanna just answer that. Um, Amanda, if you could post that, thank you. So yeah, this question is just to get a feel for who's joining us today and where folks live. While the poll is going, I just wanted to introduce myself real quick. I'm Amanda Sanders. Uh, if you have any questions during the meeting, feel free to send them to me by the Zoom chat. And I wanted to let everybody know that the um, PowerPoint slides will be available uh, later this week. They'll be posted to the website on the project page. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. So it looks like I think most people answer the poll. Um, so let's take a look. We have most folks live outside of Hayward, outside of the um, immediate project area in other parts of Alameda or Contra Costa County. So, um, so we have a good, a good mix of people today that are interested in learning more about this project. So thank you guys for participating. And like I mentioned earlier, there will be a survey that we ask you um, to participate in. We'll share the link for that later. It'll also be on the project website. So now I'd just like to introduce a few folks um, who are gonna be co-hosting the meeting and presenting today. Thank you, Amanda, again. So Amanda Sanders is a senior administrative specialist for the Park District, and she will be co-hosting the meeting and help us field questions later on during the presentation. Uh, Matt Grawl is a chief of stewardship for the Park District, and uh, Chris Barton is a restoration projects manager. And Matt and Chris will be doing um, the presentation here in a little bit and give us some background and information about the project. And um, Director Waspy is a board member for Ward 3, which includes the Hayward Regional Shoreline. Um, so now I'll turn it over to Director Waspy for opening remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Carla. And, and you took my whole speech. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Welcome to everyone for being here. We're very happy that you're here participating in this evening's workshop, especially because there's a World Series on and the Warriors are playing at the same time. So, but we're going to review a, a number of concepts and, and ways that we think we can restore the Hayward Marsh. Uh, the Hayward Marsh is part of an important section of the shoreline along the San Francisco Bay. Um, it's had many uses, but uh, recently, since 1985, treated wastewater has been used to create fresh and brackish marshes in this area and has provided habitat for many, many sp sensitive species. Um, as you'll hear more about this evening, the wastewater operations no longer are going to provide fresh water into the marsh. Uh, and along with predicted sea level rise um, conditions along the shoreline, this presents a, some challenges and, and but we consider it opportunities to restore the habitat, enhance the San Francisco Bay Trail and plan for future conditions that are gonna occur down there. Uh, with input from tonight's meeting, uh, we'll work together to find the right solution, hopefully, uh, to improve the Hayward Marsh uh, in a way that, you know, we always try to do, which carefully balances habitat improvements for sensitive species and shoreline resilience. So um, thank you all for being here again. Uh, I look forward to a great meeting tonight, and I'll turn it back over to Carla. Thank you, Director Waspy, for that, um, for that welcome. And I think we can jump into the presentation now. So Matt, I'll turn it over to you whenever you're ready. Hey, thanks, Carla. Um, and welcome everyone, it's an exciting time. Um, Matt Grawl, the Chief of Stewardship, and just excited to talk about the restoration opportunities out here along the Hayward shoreline. Um, there's some very unique habitats um, adjacent and within the Hayward Marsh uh, system. 
to provide uh, great opportunities to create um, connections to the adjacent habitat and to really expand the marsh complex uh, present along the Hayward Regional Shoreline. And so it's an exciting time to be thinking about restoration, to look at the options um, to expand um, the habitat and to um, improve uh, habitat conditions out in this um, area. So um, next slide. So this slide shows really kind of the location of the Hayward Marsh. Uh, the Hayward Marsh, as it says, it, the Hayward Regional Shoreline. And the project area we're talking about is just immediately uh, north of Highway 92. Um, and as you can see on the inset map on the left, um, uh, on that purple outline, um, that shows that the Hayward Marsh is immediately um, south of uh, what we call Cogswell Marsh. So that area, um, the green area above the purple outline is the Cogswell Marsh. So um, this project really creates an opportunity um, to better um, connect those systems and, um, and create a more connected habitat within these areas. Um, okay, next slide. Um, so the Hayward Marsh, as Director Wasi said, has been operated since 1985 as a treatment marsh um, in partnership with the Union Sanitary District. Um, and so the Park District has been working um, with Union Sanitary District for a number of years um, to utilize this marsh um, to provide the, the, the dual benefits of uh, water quality improvement and water quality um, and treatment of that wastewater um, and before it reaches San Francisco Bay, but also during this time it's provided great habitat um, for shorebirds and also for waterfowl um, in the freshwater portions of the marsh. Um, during the height of the marsh when it was in um, operating in the best conditions and operating, we had thousands of birds at any one time um, in, in, in throughout this complex. Um, and also it's provided a habitat for a host of endangered species. So uh, some of the islands within the marsh provide habitat for California least tern and snowy plover. And in recent years, we've also had black skimmer nesting on those islands. Um, so really a suite of threatened endangered species um, on one of the islands. And the adjacent uh, marshes also provide habitat for soil marsh harvest mouse and Ridgeways rail. Um, so it, it's just a very unique habitat surrounding this area um, and an important critical habitat. Um, and so the marsh was designed to, you know, to, to treat the wastewater and, and mix it with brackish water um, and create habitat and, and, and improve the water quality of the, of the system. But it didn't come without challenges. There were some significant challenges in operating the system, and it was built on old salt ponds um, initially. And, and those salt pond levee roads and the old existing levee roads weren't engineered uh, when the marsh was constructed for heavy trucks or for um, easy maintenance of the, of the channels in the marsh. And so it, over time, mar the, the, um, some of the levees started failing and, and the channel started silting in. And we started looking at doing some of the large scale maintenance that would be required it was gonna be very expensive to do that maintenance um, with the, the existing conditions um, at the site. And so the park district worked with Union Sanitary District to do a feasibility study um, for the marsh to look at what the um, habitat, I mean, what the needs would be to re rehab the marsh to make it function. And the park district's preferred option in that feasibility study in 2015 identified a cost of about $27.5 million to, to, do, to rehab this area um, to meet um, some of the water quality needs um, and to also um, provide habitat and make it easy to manage as a wastewater marsh and provide that long-term maintenance of ongoing dredging and things. Um, but that um, rehabilitation and retrofit of $27.5 million was just a little bit too much um, from the park district's eyes to continue providing that wastewater treatment marsh. And we felt like from our perspective, we could do more to restore the area and provide habitat um, with those dollars. And Union Sanitary District felt that really there was concern with the large investment here when they wouldn't have certainty of meeting the water quality benefits uh, for the project um, with, with this marsh condition. So there was concern about investing that much money and not necessarily being able to be guaranteed to meet their permit requirements in future years as nutrient limits are added into NPDES permits and then nutrient levels are further regulated. There was concern about whether the marsh could meet those limits. And so uh, we both decided to kind of go our separate ways and develop de um, differing projects. And so this is the park district's um, opportunity to then restore this area uh, because the park district um, owns these lands uh, um, that um, you know, the marsh currently exists on. So uh, that's what we're working on today. And Chris will talk more about um, you know, the project and the options we're looking at to restore the marsh system. Good, e good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Barton. I'm the Park District's Restoration Projects Manager, 
And um, I've been working closely with our stewardship department, operations and planning departments um, um, who formed a team who's been working on this for uh, several, well, over a year now, actually. Uh, and we've also got on, on our call, Austin Payne with Upright Engineering, um, who, who is our lead consultant that is helping with the technical studies and coming up with the designs for this project. So in, our, in my talk tonight, um, in reviewing the concepts, I'm gonna provide some background uh, to uh, talk through the goals and then to touch on the existing conditions and then to uh, go over the scope, the current scope of work that we're working on um, completing and then the schedule. Uh, and then from there, I'll run through and introduce the uh, project concepts. And then after that, we'll go to question and answer. Um, and we'll also have comment cards in case you think of some comments or questions uh, later on. So jumping right into the goals, uh, the first goal is to enhance wildlife habitat. And what we're talking about is maintaining, improving and expanding nesting habitat for California least terns, salt marsh harvest mouse, black skimmer, snowy plover and water birds and to restore tidal wetland habitat, including muted tidal, and improve the managed ponds and water quality in those ponds, and to provide marsh upland habitat, uh, marsh upland transitional habitat, and also to increase habitat connectivity where we can. The next goal is to plan for sea level rise. Uh, we wanna protect the Bay Trail and pond infrastructure and other habitat features from coastal flooding and erosion protect sensitive habitats and provide opportunities for upslope migration and to plan for future retreat of habitat and infrastructure from the shoreline. Our third goal is to improve public access opportunities. Uh, and we have to recognize that the marsh has been closely managed as an endangered species refuge with limited public access. So what we mean by improving public access opportunities, we're talking about looking for ways to keep the Bay Trail along the Bay as long as possible, or, or to the extent that it's feasible, I should say, and to reduce operations and maintenance of the Bay Trail due to coastal flooding, and to plan for viable trail connections uh, to existing adjacent uh, trail networks while avoiding um, or minimizing impacts on wildlife. And there are also opportunities for environmental education in the form of interpretive panels uh, and viewing areas. And our fourth goal is to improve management capabilities. We want to enhance our ability to perform maintenance of levees, channels, water control structures, and other site infrastructure, uh, such as access roads for maintenance and wildlife management. And we're looking for uh, long lasting, low maintenance infrastructure and to reduce siltation in the ponds and channels and provide accommodations for desilting. So as Matt mentioned, when the marsh was originally built, some those roads are not um, built for the heavy equipment that's needed for uh, this kind of maintenance. And we wanna improve our ability to adapt to water quality issues, including uh, mosquito um, outbreaks um, and other water quality challenges. So um, we, the, the project team uh, is informed by a number of refer references and resources. Um, I'm listing a few here. The first one being the Baylands Ecosystem Habitat Goals Project, which identifies uh, goals and objectives uh, in, for the entire San Francisco Bay, including Hayward Shoreline. Uh, the subtitle Habitat Goals Report, which uh, focuses more on the intertidal and subtitle um, habitat features that can be added to different areas of the bay. Um, and then the recently completed HASPA Hayward Regional Shoreline Adaptation Master Plan, which is um, a great timing to have the completion of that plan. It has really informed us in the, in the uh, locations of our interim levees and our trail connections without having that plan in place um, it would be really hard to see how our site fits in the larger uh, puzzle. Um, and then, of course, there are other San Francisco Bay restoration projects. The South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project. Uh, we recently um, had a tour with John Krauss with CDFW to uh, hear about some of the challenges and lessons learned from down there. And we also have the benefit of having Austin Payne, um, our consultant on board, who is also involved in that project. And Park District has uh, quite a few other restoration projects along the Bay that we've learned lessons from that we hope to apply here. 
And last but not least, this site has a long history since the 80s of site-specific species management of least turn snowy plover and salt marsh harvest mouse and other species. Um, so just to kind of review where we're at in this process, our current scope of work covers a feasibility analysis um, and 35% and design and analysis of the environmental effects of the project under CEQA. So we've recently completed the technical studies that feed into our feasibility analysis. We completed that this past spring, and we're currently at the last stage of our schematic uh, design um, where we've produced three concepts, three design concepts, and that's what we plan on going over tonight. And we've shared these concepts already uh, to a number of our agency stakeholder partners and um, our board executive committee has reviewed uh, these concepts. And, and here we are at the public workshop um, and we, we look forward to sharing these concepts with you and hearing your feedback and any questions that you might have. Um, following, following this step, we will be taking everything that we've heard and going back to um, design a 35% um, plan. And from there, we will circle back with our agency stakeholders, our board executive committee, and then our full board of directors uh, will consider the project description and the 35% design. And then, uh, and then the next stage would be to go into CEQA analysis, and that would be later next year. Um, just to acknowledge and recognize some of the agency partners that we've reached out to and have been working with, uh, and those include the City of Hayward, the Hayward Area Recreation and Park District, Alameda County Mosquito Abatement District, um, Alameda County Flood Control, and the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority, and specifically the BRIT, and that's an acronym for the Bay Restoration Regulatory Integration Team, which is a new group of uh, regulatory staff who have gotten together and are helping to find ways to streamline permitting. So we've uh, had a preliminary meeting with the BRIT and it's uh, great to have them have such a group. Um, now just to review the existing conditions out here, I'm gonna go through a number of slides just to orient folks um, and what we have out here. So starting at the visitor center um, off of Breakwater uh, Avenue, let me try to get my laser pointer going. Oh, there we go. So off Breakwater Avenue, we have the Hayward Area Recreation and Park District uh, Visitor Center. And from there, you can get on the, on the San Francisco Bay Trail um, and go through the hard marsh and then go through this kind of circuitous um, stretch of Bay Trail until you pass through the Hayward Marsh um, area, our project area, and work your way north to the Hard Marsh. Um, and this is actually, this is the, the public access out here um, because th this area has been operated since the 80s um, as a wastewater treatment facility. Um, it has not been open to the public and we do have high concentrations of endangered species out here who are not accustomed to having visitors. Um, the other uh, features I'd like to point out that are important is this is uh, where the least turn colony is located. This is Palm 3A. And all of this, and I guess this goes without saying, but the, the way this pond was designed is that there are a number of dikes. That's what all these white lines are. And that's how these ponds are formed. And there's water control structures that feed water um, in and then out. Um, so, so that's basically how the marsh is set up. And then we have the uh, salt marsh harvest mouse preserve that provides high quality habitat for the endangered salt marsh harvest mouse. And it's a muted tidal system where water levels are managed to provide high quality uh, pickleweed, high marsh habitat. Um, and without the existing dikes and water control structures, this habitat would be lost. And, and I don't usually use animations with slideshows, but I think it's kind of instructive to just show how the wastewater treatment ponds were originally designed to function. So this first arrow shows the freshwater input of treated wastewater at pond one. And then the fresh water from the bay comes down through this mixing channel, comes in from the mixing channel here. 
And that treated wastewater works its way through ponds 2A and 2B and eventually finds its way through to the mixing channel where the wastewater mixes uh, with that uh, water from the bay. And eventually it makes its, it's supposed to make its way through ponds uh, 3B and 3A and eventually makes its way um, out to San Francisco Bay. There are other um, inputs, um, other um, water inputs, and that uh, is mainly in the form of a, the water that's coming from the flood control channel in this direction, going into the mouse preserve through a network of uh, ditches um, and eventually making its way down to this uh, southwestern corner uh, labeled, uh, yeah, at this label right here, this yellow arrow is a large water control structure. So I'm going to run through some of the challenges we have out here. The first big, big one is we, we need to plan ahead and to uh, address not having fresh water um, into the system. Um, all of these X's represent water control structures at varying uh, degrees of failure. Um, most of some are completely um, have completely failed. Some are about to fail and others are just in poor condition. Um, there's poor water uh, control and circulation within the salt marsh harvest mouse. Um, there, there's opportunities if we improve circulation in there to improve the uh, pickleweed habitat for the mouse in that area. Um, and the mixing channel has be become silted in. So we're not getting the uh, tidal exchange uh, that we would like to see coming in from that mixing channel. And the bay, there, we've had bayfront levee erosion for many, many years that have just required frequent repairs and uh, creating hazardous conditions for trail users. Um, and here's a photograph just kind of illustrating of a typical uh, failure of these dikes out there. So this particular dike is kind of on the inboard side of pond 3A and that's the least turn, or no, that's not, that's adjacent the least turn pond. And then this other photograph shows um, the mixing channel. And so that light tannish color material is all, all the silt that's accumulated in that channel, essentially choked, choked up that channel from functioning as it was intended to. Um, and then there's a sea level rise challenge. Um, we're gonna have higher water levels. Um, so high tides will increase wave erosion and damage to the bayfront levee and trail. Um, and the existing water control structures, even if they were functioning right, they're not set at the right elevations um, to be able to manage um, these areas with the higher water levels. And low tides will be higher with sea level rise. So that's going to impede uh, drainage and the habitat will be drowned out in the mouse preserve. And then with those higher water levels where the flood control channel comes out, um, there's gonna be issues with um, urban runoff not having anywhere to go and backing up into the urban areas. Um, so before we review the options, um, I'd like to take a moment to review the different habitat types being considered at Hayward Marsh. So the first one is tidal marsh. And when, when I say tidal marsh, we're talking about high and low marsh. Um, which is essentially located between mud flat and this transition zone. So this brownish color and the yellow. Um, and you can see the, this blue line is the tidal fluctuation over a 48 period. So essentially the high marsh floods less frequency, less frequently um, than the low marsh. And then the mud flat is uh, inundated. It's flooded with water even longer. Um, and um, about inter intertidal mudflats, um, I'd like to point out that, you know, because sometimes I see mudflats out there and they're quite extensive and it's, uh, it's not immediately apparent what the, the benefits of these mudflats are, but uh, mudflats are very important habitats for birds and fish providing feeding and resting areas for waders and waterfowl and acting as uh, nursery areas for fish and crustaceans. And it also provides uh, natural coastal defense against storm surges. The third uh, category I wanted to kind of talk through is muted tidal. So muted tidal is where we have uh, tidal fluctuation of water levels uh, being controlled. Uh, in this case, for this site, by a network of dikes and tide gates. So if 
with this tidal fluctuation where you can see a really high tide and a low tide here in this peak and this trough, a muted tidal situation would show a flatter blue line where the flooding is more controlled uh, to an elevation that we're seeing on the ground. So we're, we're able to establish um, different types of types of habitat with our management of muted tidal um, systems. An example of that I, I mentioned is the salt marsh harvest mouse preserve on site where, where the dikes and water control structures keep water levels lower than they would normally be. And that this is allowing pickleweed and high marsh to persist for the harvest mouse, uh, which would otherwise be flooded out. But as water levels rise and the dikes and water control structures no longer function, we won't be able to maintain those water levels for the mouse. And then the fourth uh, category um, I wanted to talk about is managed ponds. So the managed ponds are not subject to daily water fluctuations and the water levels can be set by water control structures. So the California least turn colony at pond 3A is a good example of this habitat type where water levels are managed to maintain a set water level around the turn island. And another example of a managed pond is where we have a pond system that's designed to fill up with rainwater in the winter uh, for waterfowl, and then it's drained and left dry in the summer uh, for species like um, California least tern. Um, and I'd like to point out that the existing condition, most of these ponds are either uh, or the, the whole marsh complex is mainly comprised of muted tidal and managed pond right now. So here we go, we're gonna dive into, I, I hope that that last section was uh, helpful for those that don't um, spend too much time looking at tidal, um, tidal changes and what kinds of habitat are associated with those. Um, so now I'm gonna be going into, uh, describe and talk through three options that the project team has developed. Um, and this range of options is to kind of bookend the, uh, the, the different possibilities we have out here to um, meet our project goals. Um, before I go into the details of the options, I'd like to point out um, some of the elements that are common to all of them. So the first one, is uh, the living shoreline feature. So if you look to the bayfront over here on the outboard side of Pond 3B, where this is San Francisco Bay, this red uh, is uh, showing living shoreline. So what we're talking about here are submerged shoals, uh, rock groins, pebble beaches. Um, and the intent here is to protect the inlets and outlets from plugging to attenuate wave energy and help protect bay, the bay trail and the, the ponds to the east from flooding. Um, and then subtidal and intertidal habitat enhancements uh, to benefit fish and birds. And that could be in the form of um, oyster reefs um, or other living shoreline um, techniques that, have, that are being explored in San Francisco Bay right now. Um, the other... Uh, key feature that's common to all the options is this dark dashed red line. And this is an interim levy uh, that's designed to um, address a number of things. Um, the first one being our salt marsh harvest mouse uh, adaptation strategy. So um, by having this interim levy, we'll be able to um, retain the tidal marsh at the mouse preserve in the near and the medium term. Uh, and then the second, um, the second uh, project uh, objective that it addresses is, uh, is the adaptation strategy for the California least turn uh, colony. So currently Pond 3A um, is at risk of being inundated by these higher tides, but this interim levy uh, will allow us to protect Pond 2B and construct additional islands here and design them similar to the islands that we have at Pond 3A. So when the time comes for these, these least turn um, islands to look, that they're no longer viable, they would have a place that they could um, move to over here at Pond 2A. And then thirdly, the third main uh, thing that our interim levy uh, addresses is the Bay Trail because eventually the Bay Trail, in the, especially in the, in the medium and the longer terms, will no longer be viable along the Bay Front. So 
the levee will be built so that it can serve several functions. It could be used for um, um, operations, maintenance, uh, wildlife management, uh, but it can also be used uh, as a bay trail, uh, as of the bay trail, um, when conditions are, are too severe and we're no, no longer able to keep the bay trail at the bay front. Um, so, um, so those are the options that are common to all the options. And for each of the options, I'm gonna go through the near term. So the, uh, the zero to 20 year time horizon. So essentially what we get out the gate when the project first gets delivered. And then there's gonna be a medium term which looks out further uh, with sea level rise. Um, and then there's gonna be even a longer term um, uh, graphic for each uh, option that, that looks, at, looks at five years of sea level rise um, beyond year 50. And uh, so for this option, uh, what's unique is, um, well, first of all, well, the, the title is to maximize near-term title. And what's unique about this option is it emphasizes on, its emphasis is on creating channels and improving tidal circulation. Um, so there's no raising of ponds for long-term adaptation. Um, it makes tidal connections uh, to the north at Cogswell here, and then to the south at the Hard Marsh um, down here. And for each of the options, um, and as they change um, from the near term, medium term, and the the long term, there's a um, a pie pie chart here that shows the um, kind of just the proportional breakdown of uh, what the different habitat types are. So it's hopefully that's helpful to kind of see how the uh, habitat is changing over time. So the next slide, we'll see what the site looks like with two feet of sea level rise uh, in 20 years. Um, so turning our attention to the Bay Trail, the Bay Trail previously was on the Bay Front, and here you can see it's been relocated um, on top of the interim levee and is connecting with Cogswell Marsh to the north. And the other thing that we can see um, is that the least turn uh, colony area, and that's Pond 3A, it transitions from a managed pond to an intertidal mudflat, uh, and the least turns um, are then relocated um, to pond 2A. Um, so in the next slide, uh, we'll see water levels rise five feet over 50 years. Um, and uh, please keep in mind that these long-term projections um, don't take into consideration additional interventions that may take place over the course of 50 years as we learn new adaptation techniques and multi-jurisdictional flood control partnerships are formed. Um, these flood control projects may include additional public access and habitat improvements. So what has changed here? The subtitle habitat uh, and, and tidal marsh along the bayfront remains. Um, the ponds and mouse preserve become mud, mud flats. And along the, uh, the kind of urban interface with the park, um, this becomes a flood protection levee um, along this perimeter. And the Bay Trail uh, would also be relocated uh, to this area. Um, and there, it's foreseeable that with this um, larger flood control levee, that there could be opportunities for horizontal levee construction um, and also providing upland transition habitat and other habitat design features. Um, with that design. So moving to option two, um, the main difference between options one and two is the creation of upland transition um, habitat at ponds one here and pond 2B. And then three, pond 3A, what's really unique about this option is pond 3A is designed to withstand higher water levels. Um, so it'll, it'll keep the um, least turn island habitat viable for a longer period of time um, in, into that, uh, that medium term. And it, it keeps the tidal connection at the bay as it currently is at these locations here. So fast forward, forwarding to the uh, medium term, uh, 20 years out with two feet of sea level rise. Um, what's changed is um, the least turn colony is still there um, with this option. Uh, they don't need to be relocated. 
Uh, and we can see that the Bay Trail um, will have been moved and relocated to the uh, interim levee. And then the long-term projection, um, we can see that the uplands at ponds 1 and 2B uh, convert to tidal marsh habitat, and the remainder of the ponds become mudflats. And subtidal habitat along the bayfront remains. And there's also, uh, similar to the other options, the construction of a flood protection levee along the perimeter of the park. So going to um, option three, which uh, takes elements from options one and two and um, kind of combines them. Um, so option three um, combines them, but also includes a seasonal pond up here at pond one. Um, and then it, it keeps this uh, upland transition element that we saw with option two. And it also um, establishes um, Tidal, tidal marsh over here with um, pond 3B. And that's similar to option one. And also similar to option one, we have tidal connections to the north, uh, to Cogswell Marsh, and to the south, to the hard marsh. And moving to the medium term um, with option three. So the least turn colony, um, would be inundated, it would, uh, it would convert to mud flat and the lease term would have to be uh, helped to move over to pond 2A and the San Francisco Bay Trail would be relocated. But we can, it really stands out here is for the pie chart is it does provide kind of the, the largest or um, broadest offering of habitat types with this option. And then in the long term, um, with with this option. So the upland habitat at pond uh, 2B uh, changes, that, so that upland changes to tidal uh, marsh, and then 3B remains tidal marsh, and the remainder of the ponds become mudflat. And the subtidal habitat elements along the bayfront remain, and we have the um, flood protection levee along the perimeter of the project site. So here's a, a, a very brief evaluation of the project goals. Um, so um, option one, and that was the option to maximize near-term tidal, um, the emphasis on creating channels and improving tidal circulation. So no raising of ponds for long-term adaptation. Um, it scores high in the near term because it greatly improves tidal circulation. Um, it scores low in the medium Term, low and the medium term, or sorry, I apologize. In the, in the, it scores low in the medium and long term because elevations have not been raised on site, resulting in a less diverse mix of habitat. And um, the cost comes in at around from 20 to 26 million. And these are preliminary cost estimates of uh, total project cost, um, not just construction costs. Option two. This is the maximized resilience to sea level rise that extends the life of the least turn island at 3A. Um, and it raises pond elevations offering more upland transition than option three. It sc scores lower in the near term uh, because habitat value of the upland transition zone versus muted tidal in the near term may be slightly lower. And it scores high in the medium term because pond 3A will still be viable for the California lease turn uh, in the medium term. And um, with both, both options two and three, um, they didn't get the three pluses for the long term because there's room for raising elevations further uh, to provide a greater mix of habitat, which really translates into more money. Um, so there's a balance that, needs, that we need to find here um, because we, we, we can't, just place an unlimited amount of dirt um, out here. Um, it just wouldn't be uh, feasible at that point. So option two comes in at a cost of 26 to $32 million. And the higher cost is, is mostly due to the need for more fill, more earthwork to be done uh, to create those upland transition uh, zones. And then we, get, we come to option three. Um, 
similar to option two, but provides seasonal uh, pond instead of upland transition, um, which, which does provide a, a wider range of uh, high value habitat types in the near term, while providing a similar mix of mud flat and tidal marsh in the long term. So we, we see a higher score um, in the near term because this option includes more habitat types than others, uh, it includes upland transition, muted tidal, tidal marsh, uh, managed pond and seasonal pond. And it scores high in the medium term because it retains a broad range of habitat types. And uh, as, as I mentioned, it's, it's not gonna get three stars in the long term because if there's opportunity to bring more fill in there, then it would probably it would score higher. We'd be able to uh, provide a wider range of habitat in that longer planning horizon. And the, the cost comes in at um, about 21 to 27 million dollars. Okay, so to recap, we look forward to receiving your feedback tonight on the project. Um, We'll be taking your comments and feedback from this workshop uh, to our, um, and we'll also be taking the feedback that our board of directors um, have given us at previous meetings um, and from our meetings with our agency stakeholder partners to develop a project description and a preliminary 35% design for our board, our full board of directors to consider. Um, then the project team will analyze the environmental effects of the project under the California Environmental Quality Act and bring it back to our board to review and consider that analysis. And we're aiming for uh, spring, summer of next year. And from there, our board can uh, decide if they uh, and direct us to proceed with developing construction documents. That would really be the, the, uh, the next step. Um, that would be the next um, scope of work that we would be embarking on um, and obtaining permits. So that concludes the um, presentation and overview of the concepts. Um, and I know I, I went through a lot of information, a lot of concepts. I, I tried to point out the differences between them, um, but uh, we look forward to any questions or comments we might receive. And I'll turn it back over to Carla and she'll keep us in order. Thank you, Chris. So before we move on to our question and answer session, I just want to invite everyone here to, if you wanna take your camera phone, you can jump on the survey, um, the survey and the project website. You can just hover your camera over either of these QR codes and it'll take you directly to the link. You don't even need to, to take a photo of it. Um, we'll also post the survey on the project website. If you want to take the survey at a later time, you don't have to do it now. And just to remind folks that if anyone needs a Spanish translation or has a question that you might wanna ask in Spanish, senior planner John Holder can be reached at, um, his email address is down here at the bottom. So please feel free to reach out to John. And I think we can jump into any questions um, folks have, you can feel free to enter your questions in the chat, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. So just type them in there and Amanda will, um, will help us field those questions and we'll read them out and answer them as they come in. So feel free folks to, to share any feedback or, or ask any questions. Thank you, Carla. I, I do have a couple of questions, um, so I'll go ahead and get started with those. Uh, the first question comes from Corinne High, and uh, they said, could you explain what you envision as upland habitat? What elevation would this be at, and would there be separation from the Bay Trail? Chris, if you want to take that one. Sure, yeah. Um, so the the upland habitat types um, would. Chris, um, and I think you might be muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, yeah. thanks, Carla. Um, so we, we, the areas that we're we're showing the upland uh, transition zones, those were uh, pond one. So that was the area where the uh, wastewater first goes into the system, and then pond. Uh, 2B, um, we were showing uh, upland transition. 
And those areas um, are, are not near the Bay, San Francisco Bay Trail. They're, they're actually quite far away. So the, the, there is quite a buffer there um, from the Bay Trail. And elevation wise, and we do have Austin, our engineer on board, and Austin, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the elevations we would be aiming for there would probably be in the, probably like the, the, the high marsh being around elevation six and a half and working its way up to seven and a half and, and going higher as it transitions, uh, probably up to like elevation 13 and a half to 14 um, to, to, to move from that transitional habitat to um, upland. Yeah, I think that's about right. I mean, maybe a little lower than that potentially, but um, you know, I think we'd be targeting a future marsh elevation. So if this current marsh is at around six and a half, and you know, five feet of elevation change would put that at eleven and a half. Okay. Uh, if I think that answered the question, and uh, I have another question uh, from Corinne High. Uh, this one says: Is there a possibility of constructing an interim levy that provides protections? Uh, for the salt marsh harvest mouse in the near and medium term that might not be as robust as what has been proposed. Thinking that ultimately all options have a flood protection levy at the landward side of the site and in all options the bay trail ends up being relocated there. Is there any opportunities for cost savings by planning for the long term sooner? Um. Amanda, can you repeat the beginning part of the question? I'm sorry. Sure, no problem. Is there a possibility of constructing an interim levy that provides protections for the salt, the salt marsh harvest mouse in the near and medium term that might not be as robust as what has been proposed in your three options? Okay, I'm gonna let Austin, our engineer, to speak to that because he he's uh, really uh, keyed in on these elevations and whether or not we could, um, a, a more robust one or not, would uh, work at this site to protect the, uh, or to, to keep that salt marsh harvest mouse um, area muted tidal uh, condition. Austin, you wanna take that one? Sure, yeah. Um, well, so I guess in my mind, we do kind of have this, um, interim levy that is protecting the um, you know the salt marsh harvest mouse preserve for as long as possible. I don't know if it's possible to bring up um, one of those um, slides from <clears throat> maybe like the medium term of option three. So um, so. This the, the bay the bay trail is being shown with that uh, orange line with like a dashed you know line down the middle of it, and so that levee would be improved to elevation. Um, I think we said like fourteen or so, uh, twelve or fourteen feet. So yeah, the intent of that levee would be. Um, to provide not only an interim location for the Bay Trail because the existing Bay Trail experiences such erosion issues, it would be to provide some protection to um, the Mouse Preserve as well as Pond 2A, which is the future home of the least term colony. So I, I think, you know, the intent of that would be to, um, you know, have that protection whenever we need it. So we'd build it now. And then when, when the time does come, we'd move the Bay Trail there um, and we'd have some protection for our habitat. And then, you know, in the face of five feet of sea level rise, um, we're gonna need some help from, you know, somebody else, I think, to build the, uh, the future levee along the um, upland or, you know, development interface edge there. Great, thanks Austin. And that is all the questions I have currently. Does anybody else have any questions that's on the call? And if folks want another look at any of the slides, cause I did go through them fairly quickly, um, I'd be happy to um, show them 
too. So if that's your question to see option one, two, or three again, I'm happy to do that too. With that, and even if you have a comment, if you're having trouble with the QR codes or accessing the survey, um, Director Waspy, were you able to access the survey? No, no, I wasn't. Okay. But I, I mean, I, I can, I didn't know that I was gonna participate. I, I will participate for sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm okay with it for now. Okay. Well, I'm assuming everyone was able to figure it out then. Um, there's no, no questions about how it worked. Um, maybe we can go back to the last slide. So if anybody who didn't have a chance to uh, hover over those with their camera on their phone, they can. Also, the, um, the links are written out if you prefer to type it. You just have more of a chance of making an error that way. <laughs> um, I did get another uh, question, and this one is from Pat Gordon. And they asked, uh, are you working with HARD regarding the inter uh, center? Um, the the interim center is actually not on the park district's property, um, and it's I, I'm I'm just managing this project, and it really has the issue has not come up the interpretive center um, as it relates to uh, this project. And that's not to say that there there might not be other discussions going on, but I, I'm not aware of them. Uh, category. Okay, and um, one last thing from uh, Corinne High. Uh, they said that the chat uh, doesn't really allow back and forth to clarify questions. Um, is there any opportunity to discuss the project directly? Yes, um, yeah, so we do, it, when you go into the survey, there's also a, a part of the last question, and Carla, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe there's like just an open comment that's there. Um, so if you think of any comments or questions you might have, you can put them there. And, and, and also you can, you, yes, you can contact um, me for more information or Carla. Yeah, I can, I can pop my email address in the chat also, but you're right, Chris, in the, the survey link, there's, there's a comment um, box at the end where you can leave any comments or feedback for the project team. Yeah, and we did receive a question from uh, Karen High about um, the pond elevation. So I'm hoping that we provided that information, sufficient information on that during the presentation. Um, and if not, we, because we, we don't have a published exhibit for that, we do have survey data. So we could provide a range of elevations for that if, if that would be helpful. Any other, any other questions or feedback? I think we'll leave the, the survey up for, for at least a few weeks. So if folks think of other questions or does that sound about right, Chris, or? Yeah, how yeah, long so what were you thinking? Yeah, so if, uh, so if folks have friends who visit the Hayward Marsh and would like to participate but couldn't make it to this meeting, um, you could share the survey with them. Uh, and we're going to keep the survey um, open um, so that folks can, um, you know, if they think of new comments or questions uh, over the next week or two, they can revisit the um, survey. Well, actually, I think when I tried the survey, it only let you, it'll only let you do it once. <laughs> so if you if it, if it only lets you do it once, then um, feel free to email Carla and I, and we'd be happy to take your your written comments or um, or give us a call. And so, like Amanda mentioned earlier, we'll also put the PowerPoint slides up on the project website. Um, and there's also a brochure and project flyer on there. So there's definitely more information on the website for, for you guys to share with others also. All right. 
What's the get, best, yeah, what's the best any, practice here for when we have a minute of silence? <laughs> do we have any other questions, Amanda? I have no other questions. Okay. Um, unless anybody sends me one in like the next minute or so, I say we go ahead and close out and okay. people can contact uh, you guys uh, either th through the survey monkey or through emails as posted. Great. Thank and you. I want to thank direct director Waspy and Carla and Amanda for putting this all together and um, and and Austin and our consultant team as well. Uh, and, and and for everyone being here when they may want to be out watching something else on <laughs> besides being in a zoom meeting. So thank you. And I'd like to thank you, Chris, and, and your staff. Uh, that was a great presentation. It's complicated. It's very, very timely. Uh, this is a big deal. This is our where we live, and it's going to be underwater. Uh, I, I was wondering, uh, thank you so much, but I was wondering if you could just one more time uh, and thank everybody that came here. Uh, but we're going to continue this. There's going to be more meetings. Uh, share it with your friends. We welcome anybody's input. Uh, so could you review one more time that slide that shows what the next steps will be until the board makes a decision and votes on it uh, probably next year sometime? Sure. Yeah, so so the, ne the next steps will be to develop the 35% design. Um, and from there, we'll, we'll be reaching back out to our agency stakeholder partners and bringing this back to our board executive committee. Um, and, and then in this case, it will be for a recommendation uh, for adoption of uh, this plan, 35% plan, and, and it'll go to the full board of directors. And for that, we're aiming for uh, winter of uh, end of this year going into next year is the approximate timeframe for that. Um, and then once, once our board has decided to um, to adopt that 35% design, then we would go into this uh, CEQA analysis um, stage of the project. And it'll take us four or five months to get through that stage of the project, and then we'll bring it back to our full board um, for uh, review and consideration of those impacts. Great, thank you. And for everybody that doesn't know, pardon me, Amanda, that you know, all of our board meetings and all of our committee meetings are your the public is welcome and your input is is uh, appreciated. Sorry about that, Director Waspy. <laughs> I uh, I did have one last question, and it was uh, when the recording will be available to share. And Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're hoping to get most uh, most of the uh, presentation materials up on the website uh, later this week or early next week. Yeah, we're going to do our best to get it posted at that time. Thank you, everyone. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us tonight to talk about this project. Um, so again, just feel free to reach out to us to hop on the project website and email us or um, provide your feedback on the survey. And um, we'll work together more to uh, work through this project. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye, Thank folks. you.